independent music community, and I'm glad to have the uh, the president of CD Baby himself, Brian Felson, and the CEO of Empire Distribution, Ghazi Shami. Thank you guys for uh, joining us today. Wow. All right. So just to give everybody a little background um, about uh, CD Baby and Empire, um, these companies are both distribution companies in you know both their rights, but uh, do business a little bit different than each other, and that's why I wanted to bring them together because they bring a different contrast of different types of, of artists during different stages of their careers, and I think they both offer um, extremely important resources um, when you are uh, building up your brand and building up your music career. So I'm really happy to have everyone on. So Brian, let's get right into it. Um, First, go ahead, and, and if you want to introduce yourself and you know give a little background about yourself as well, go ahead. Brian, doesn't seem like we hear you. Let me. Uh... <clears throat> Brian, you there? Well, Gazi, why don't you go ahead? Why don't you go ahead and uh, get started and introduce yourself and the company that you um, represent, and then we'll wait for Brian to get started, maybe through uh, the web. Yeah, no problem. Can you hear me okay? Yep. So um, I'm Gazi Shami. I'm the CEO and founder of uh, Empire Distribution. We've been on for about four years, more or less. Um, officially, on paper, we've been in business for two years, but we've been around for quite some time. Um, I've been involved in the music industry for probably close to 20 years now, since my childhood, and done everything from produce, engineer, write, distribute, market, promote, um, every facet of the music industry you could think of. I have a pretty extensive technology background, spent a lot of time in the Silicon Valley doing everything from systems integration to embedding video streams early on in the late 90s, and everything else you could think of, you know, kind of a jack of all trades. Um, uh, and Empire Distribution is simply just a culmination of all those talents and all those experiences together um, fit into one uh, entity um, that's here to provide service to artists and you know, help artists get their music to the masses. Cool, and we'll get into detail in a little bit about you know some of the projects that you're working on and some of the things that you're doing in the distribution world and marketing world as well. Uh, Brian, are you there? Brian, are you there? <clears throat> All right, I think he's jumping back in. Brian, you there? Mm. Don't seem to have any audio from you. Yeah, we don't we don't have any audio from you, Brian. Unfortunately, if you can connect um, through the any meeting microphone on your computer rather than using the conference number. I don't know. All right, guys. Well, I'm I'm gonna, you know, ask ask this first question, and um, and we'll go from there when I open it up for discussion. But uh, what I respect most about you know Empire is that a lot of your releases receive premium placement on you know online music stores, and they're very well positioned on you know on the major stores like iTunes and Amazon and Spotify. Now, what are, the, what are the deciding factors when you do a deal with an artist, and when do you decide that they have a project worth pitching to these retailers for, for, for that type of feature placement? At what uh, point? Really, honestly, when we work with a lot of artists, um, it's the process of measuring all the metrics, um, looking at an artist, you know, uh, YouTube views, sound scan numbers, previous sound scan history, um, their market footprint, social networking, um, what type of an artist are they? Are they an artist that's big in the streets? Are they big in the blog world? Are they big in the clubs? Are they touring? Is there radio play? Um, we measure pretty much everything there is to measure about an artist, and then we try to make a decision whether this artist fits our system or not. Um, we're not a, a sign-up service. You can't sign up with us. Um, we're still doing the old-fashioned A&R technique where we look at what it is that's being uh, pitched to us, and then we make, you know, we look at the, the market value of the projects and then we make those kind of decisions uh, based on what you know the market footprint of the artist is. 
Um, with that being said, sometimes we just take a chance on good music and they don't have any story. You know, sometimes we just pick up a record, an artist, a label just because we simply believe in what it is that they have. Um, we actually uh, signed this kid, Nate, um, who's a San Francisco native recently, and uh, it looks like Vigo is going to put him into the, the Lyft program um, for new artists, which is pretty cool for him. Um, it looks like MTV Jams is going to make his video, or has already made his video at the end of the week, I believe. He's a new artist. He didn't have no story. We just simply, uh, one of my ANRs here internally, Nima Atmanon, saw his stuff on YouTube, liked him, got a hold of him, got a hold of his management, signed him up. Um, so everything from, you know, artists that were on top that are on their way down, artists that are on the bottom on their way up, and everything in between. Um, there's no exact science to it. Um, a lot of it is just measuring a lot of different things and using a lot of gut feeling and, and using our expertise as, you know, we've been in the music industry for a long time. Um, so I think I have a good gut feeling about music now. That's dope. You, you rarely hear a lot of, a lot of stories about you know, labels or, or, you know, or distributors just, just picking up an artist based on them being a fan of the music itself. And, you know, I think that all drives with because of your music background and, you know, what you've done in the industry outside of just label and distribution, you were, you were more on, you know, had a, had a, uh, had a background in engineering and things like that. What was, what was a musician or an artist that, you know, that, that really touched you? initially early on for you to have a passion for, for the things that you're doing? What, what artists really moved you with their lyrics? I mean, that depends if you're talking about hip-hop. Um, my first exposure to American music was not hip-hop. Um, my first exposure to American music was Billy Joel. It was rock. Um, and, you know, I heard it on the radio. I was compelled by the production and, and the lyrics and, and, you know, the chorus line and the melody and the structure. I was like seven years old and I made my cousin drive me to Rainbow Records um, when they were still in business, and I bought it on cassette tape. It was called Billy Joel Glass Houses, and it's one of his legendary albums. It was, it was a record called Still Rock and Roll to Me. Um, and then that kind of started my path on music and listening to American music and, and pop culture and, and learning a lot about pop culture. Um, my first introduction to rap that really got me started was Run DMC, Raving Hell album, um, and then being down on the West Coast, obviously. Um, that got me involved in listening to a lot of uh, West Coast hip hop acts, and then you know started to consume a lot of urban music, um, everything from Spice One all the way back to the Stevie Wonders and the Freddie Hubbards and Joe Samples and War and Santana and all that um, through the slime, you know Slime Family Stone all the way through you know 80s records, even guys in the 80s like NXS and Duran Duran and Journey and, and things of that nature, and then throughout the 90s obviously. Um, the golden age of hip hop was when I really got into engineering and, and really trying to perfect my craft and listening to a lot of music and consuming a lot of urban music. Um, but I, I pretty have I have a pretty vast um, I wouldn't say a vast knowledge of music. There's a lot of people who have a better knowledge of music, but I have a my, my passion for music extends through a lot of genres. Very cool, very cool. Yeah, you named a lot of different artists from different eras and different genres. That's really cool. I think Brian, I think you're you're connected now via. Microphone somehow. Brian, you there? Brian, you hear us? Hello. Guess not. All right, guys. Well, I guess we will get into the uh, second portion of what I, you know, what we wanted to talk with you about, and sure. you know, really, what really, you know, intrigued me more, you know, so much about Empire is that. You know, if you look at some of the releases that, that, that come through Empire, you, you, could, you could swear that, you know, these are major label releases. These are major label artists putting out um, records through your, your platform like T.I., Snoop Dogg, Kendrick Lamar, a um, bunch of, you know, really influential and iconic artists of our day. And, sure. you know, what makes Empire the destination for major label artists, like what 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 attracts them? What what draws them to want to work with Empire outside of you know their major label deals um, and and you know building building a brand in partnership with you guys? Um, honestly, everything starts with one thing, and that's having a passion for the music. Um, 
a lot of the artists that we work with, I either have a personal relationship with, I've either met um, along the way, along my path in my career, or I've worked with them in some capacity. And so the first to build a relationship and, and allow them to see the passion for the music. Because as an artist, they're passionate about their craft. And so for us, it's not all about just X's and O's, and it's not all about just numbers. It's about feeling out the music, understanding the music. Um, we're, not, we're not a distributor uh, in the traditional sense of the word. We don't just take things from point A and put them in point B. Of course, the technology is there to do that. Um, but in, in my opinion, technology is supposed to be an afterthought. Distribution is supposed to be an afterthought. What's supposed to be um, at the forefront of everybody's mind is product placement, um, you know, uh, and, and product development. So we spend most of our time with our artists developing the product, developing the music, um, developing their market footprint, helping them with marketing, promotion. Um, distribution is kind of like the last leg of what we do. It's, it's the afterthought. It, it, distribution happens on its own. Put it in the system. The technology is, is well thought out. It takes care of itself, and it puts it where it needs to go. So I think where we're headed as a company and what I'm trying to become is a tastemaker and not a distributor per se. Um, we, tr we tend to think of ourselves as tastemakers. Um, we have our thumb on the pulse of a lot of what happens early on in the industry. Um, internally, all the staff here is, is music lovers. Um, they have a vast knowledge of all genres. Um, obviously, we're very urban centric, but um, we're starting to dive into a lot of other genres from rock to gospel to dance um, and pop and other things of that nature. Um, but at, at the heart and, and, and root in, of everything is, is the passion for music. Um, and so when people see that you're passionate about their product, then they tend to be a little more trusting in giving their product over to you. Um, and then obviously build strong relationships and the word starts to travel. Um, and so our network is really deep. Um, a lot of the records that come through our pipeline are nine times out of the 10 are a referral. So many times we're not actively going after certain artists. A lot of things are coming by referral, either from A&Rs, from, from major labels, ironically, or from you know attorneys that are referring clients, or clients referring other clients. Um, <laughs> you know, clients referring other clients is probably the best thing for us. You know, probably probably the biggest win for us in the last couple of years, because um, clients have referred some pretty big other clients. Right, right, definitely, and I, and I think, and I wanted to touch on a couple of those stories. I think you know, would probably the most important one was, you know, that you guys were the initial distributor of Kendrick Lamar's Section 80 album. Um, how, did, how did that album, how did that album come about? How did you partner up with TDE and, and, and what happened to the album after he was um, signed to um, a major label? And what was the process like, like for an independent artist to go through that? Well, I mean, honestly, the way the TDE came, deal came about is uh, one of my internal a &Rs, uh, that works for me, um, Nima, who actually does owns a very uh, popular hip-hop blog site called dubcnn.com. Um, anybody who's into hip-hop has probably heard of it. Um, he had a relationship there early on uh, with K-Dot, Kendrick, and um, he brought it to my attention and was like, this guy's hot. Um, he's starting to catch on. We knew some of the other members in the camp, um, and it was brought to our attention. It was before the Section 80 album. It was an overly dedicated album, and they were giving it away for free on blogs, like on Two Dope Boys and things of that nature. And when we tried to call to the attention of the artists, and this is, you know, probably one of the things that caught their attention, um, other than the fact that we had good relationships and people knew who we were and things of that nature, was, you know, we told them, look, we understand that giving out things for free um, is, is a good system in, in, the, in the urban world, but you got to understand that new music discovery also ha um, happens on the retail side. And so that was kind of the thing that turned the leaf over, and they said, okay, well, you know, let's, let's try this out. Um, so initially the record was supposed to go out for free and, you know, one thing led to another and it ended up on iTunes and a lot of placements occurred there shortly after. And, um, I think we rocked with that album for about a year and then, and then I think it was like July, the year after we came out with the Section 80 album. Um, things, things, it was a trickle down effect. It was, it was a lot of hard work and effort on their side. Um, from our side, all we did was fill in the blanks for them, you know, get things to where it needed to go. Um. You know, get the product placements, fill in the blanks on the retailers, and, and get things where they need to go. Now, you know, when TE did, did release that album, like you said, they, they were initially wanting to release it for free and kind of just spread the word about Kendrick. But, I mean, that, that album was, um, you know, 
engineered to the T. I mean, everything sounded sounded like it was it was an album. It wasn't a mixtape. You know, a lot of times they they refer to it as a mixtape. But what do you think about artists that kind of get lost in that cycle of always releasing um, free music and and throwing them up on the blogs and and putting it up on that piff? Is is getting away free music as important nowadays? Than to create um, a very you know relevant visual that you can put up on YouTube and really relate with um, on that level. Well, I mean the irony there, there's a lot of irony in giving away free music. Um, do I think there's a systematic way to give away free music that makes sense? Yes. Um, are we in the music business still? Yes. Do we want to make money? Yes. Every artist wants to make money. So you have to do it systematically. And what we found is we found a pretty good balance on how to give away free music and how to monetize. Um, I, I like to use this example to a lot of people. Is, you know, and this might sound really silly, but it's it's very true. I mean, you have Nordstroms, you have Nordstrom Rack. They sell the same. Uh, they sell many of the same things. You can go to Nordstrom and buy a two hundred dollar pair of True Religions. You can go to Nordstrom Rack get the same pair of True Religions for ninety nine dollars. So why'd you go spend the other hundred dollars? At the end of the day, uh, human beings are creatures of habit, and so what you want to do is you want to make. And, and this is just my opinion. You want to make the material everywhere. Uh, available everywhere it can possibly be. It, somebody who's traditionally an iTunes buyer is going to purchase on iTunes if they have an iPhone. Somebody who's traditionally maybe a Google Play buyer is going to purchase on Google if they have an Android. Some people like streaming services, you know, hence Spotify, you're getting a royalty off Spotify. Some people um, like Pandora, so you're getting an exchange royalty. Um, and some people want to go on the blogs and rip off the music off Pulp Share. So at the end of the day, you want the music to be as available as possible and allow um, people to consume the music the way they're traditionally um, uh, used to consuming the music, um, right. whether it's for free, whether it's paid. Um, me personally, I don't go on blogs. Um, you know, I'm not going to spend half an hour coming to a blog to, to find something for free when I know I can just be in the middle of traffic on, on the highway and punch in the record I want and listen to it instantly on my Spotify. Um, you know, I just pay the subscription service to Spotify to listen to Spotify. Prior right. to that, I was a downloader. You know, I downloaded things. Um, but but streaming has made things very simple for me. Um, and so you actually, I think, go ahead. I'm just just you actually brought up something that kind of triggered something in my brain, is that you know as an aspiring artist, you're 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 begging for that spot on those uh, blogs that that you think is going to help break you, um, and take you to the next level. You know by being on a like you said a two dope boy or or hip hop DX or you know another one of those sites but you kind of brought up a really good important point that you just you as a label representative you as a as a person that's you know distributing and selling music you're discovering music right on the retailer itself right on right on Spotify well yeah you got to identify too that who goes on blogs blogs super serve um, you know the the core fan base the people that are crazy about you that are crazy about music. But people got to also understand that many music consumers are casual listeners, you know, and and many music consumers are also like sheep. You know, the, the radio dictates to them what's hot, what's not. The clubs dictate what's hot, what's not. The streets, the inner city dictate what's hot and what's not to the suburb, and so on and so forth. So, a lot of people are casual listeners. They're looking to the front page of iTunes to see what's out and what's new and what's fresh, you know, to consume. So they're not. Not everybody sits there and combs through music blogs or um, racks their brain for what's the hottest record out of the week. You know, I'm a music connoisseur, but I can't, you know, maybe other people are, are sports connoisseurs or, or food connoisseurs or whatever it is that they are. You know, um, but at the end of the day, for the most part, everybody listens to music. Some people are more passionate about it than others. So different people consume it in different formats and in different ways. Um, True. So, Again, for me, the blogs super serve a certain demographic, um, and, and you have to be aware of that. And also, the blogs super serve many, oftentimes, super serve a, a certain type of music. Um, you know, the, a tradition, somebody that's traditionally hot in the blog world, might not necessarily be a record that translates to the clubs, might not necessarily be a record that translates to radio, and might not necessarily be a record that translates to the streets. Um, so, you know, there's all types of artists out there. I mean. Uh, there's, a, there's an, a record right now that's number one on iTunes. I, I don't even know who the kid is. He's number one on the hip hop section. He blew up in the college circuit. That's off our radar because we're not in the colleges. You know, it's, it's a micro, it's a micro ecosystem if you want to call it that. You know. Right. Um, 
he's number one on iTunes right now. So, you know, we learned about him after the fact. So, I mean, you can research and research and, and, and look at, into things all day long, but you can't consume everything. And so that's why it's so important to have um, things out there in so many different formats. It increases the probability of you being consumed. Right, right. You know, that brings up another point, too, how you missed, you know, how you missed that, that opportunity with, you know, with the college circuit. Now, uh, you, you have another artist that you, you know, were working closely with and probably still are, um, Andre Nicotina, that, you know, that was very heavily focused on marketing to, to college and being right there in, I mean, on every university campus performing and, you know, partying, partying with the, uh, the college students. And they, they considered him, you know, I mean, and he's, I mean, what? How old is he? He's, you know, probably in his 40s now. And he's still, con he's still considered a relevant artist in college because of the, the subject matter. Now, do you feel like independent artists that can carve out a certain niche kind of like that, is, is, is it important for them to kind of venture that in, in that way, or is, it, is, or is it more important for them to focus their energy on, you know, hitting a home run and making that, making that radio record that, you know, everyone, everyone falls in love with? It, that, it, it's different strokes for different folks. Um, you know, everybody has their, their method to their madness, pick your poison, whatever, I mean, whatever, any way you want to phrase it, it's totally different music. Um, you know, and we, we've done everything in between. We've worked records to radio that have gone gold, um, and we've worked artists that have never been on radio that have been number one on iTunes, um, and, you know, and we've worked artists that have come off major labels that have crazy fan bases that all we've done is just get them an iTunes feature in their record sales. So, mm -hmm. I mean, there's really no method to it. You have to identify what type of artist um, they are um, and what it is that they're trying to be or not to be um, and then make those calculated decisions. I mean, there's, I, I, the, the radio question is a million dollar question. I'm every day. I'm like, hey, you'll know you'll have a radio record when you, you'll know when you have a radio record. The right, DJs right. come find you and the clubs will be playing your record. I think Brian checked in. Brian, are you back? Brian, do we have hope? Are we making contact? <laughs> Doesn't look like it. I'd love to get CD Baby's, you know, point of view on, you know, the type of business they're doing, but um, doesn't seem like we are able to connect with Brian at this time. But I, you know, we definitely will connect with him at some point. Uh, we will continue these B Star seminars um, throughout throughout the year and and have industry. Uh, professionals from all over be a part, but for right now, let's you know. I think me and you are having a really good discussion. I think very, it's a very, you know, very important discussion for the independent artists and a lot of people that are, um, you know, tuning in. Now, you you travel a lot. You, you know, you, you you hit up a lot of different markets. You're you're out in Houston, Atlanta, Miami, New York. I mean, you're 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 everywhere. You're you're meeting, you're greeting, you're networking with a bunch of different artists. Um, what what, who, who helps you kind of discover, you know, the next person from a local demographic to be, you know, you know from an artist standpoint, um, for you to kind of work with, to kind of de de develop a relationship with? Are you, are you, are you paying attention to, to artists that are really making a name for themselves in their local town rather than just the Internet? Sure. I mean, a lot of that, again, comes back to our network. You know, we got people on the ground that feed us information on a regular basis. Um, I think I lost you for a second, but I'm back. Um, did yep. you get what I was saying? Yeah, yeah, we got it. So, um, you know, we got a lot of people on the ground all over the country, whether it's radio promoters, A&Rs, uh, labels in those areas that are feeding us information. And, of course, um, you, know, you know, maybe this is not always the best use of my time, but my feet are on the ground in a lot of those places. I attend a lot of their conferences. I'm still in the clubs. Um, I'm still networking with DJs. I'm still talking to program directors with radio stations. I'm talking to the owners of blogs. Um, and then most importantly, I'm talking to a lot of the trendsetters from, from different cities. So they're telling me what's going on in their city. You know, so a lot of DJs will feed me information. Um, again, we watch media-based reports. So we see on, on a regional level what records are taking off. You know, if I see a record that touches the top 100 on media base, obviously that record is making some noise. Um, on a regional level or possibly on a national level. And then you dig deeper and you explore and you see are the spins fault, you know, are they fake spins, are they real spins, you know, what's going on in the market, do people know this artist, do they care about this artist, 
uh, what type of relationships does that have artists have within his own region is really important mm -hmm. to me because I want to know when I go into that region and I start representing that artist, am I going to build bridges? Am I going to burn bridges? Is it going to look good for my company? Is it going to look bad for my company? Um, at the end of the day, um, you know, we always want to put our best foot forward and keep our brand very strong. So quality is, of course, a lot more important, um, more important to us than quantity. So that's another thing that's very opposite about us than other distributors. We, we have a very limited amount of projects that we put out on a weekly basis. Um, mm -hmm. I think when digital distribution first came about, it was more about moving a lot of quantity because um, a lot of retailers were looking for setup fees and things of that nature, you know, with big catalogs and, and, and that type of stuff. I mean, that, that's cool. It's just not what I'm passionate about. I'm passionate about breaking artists and, and seeing right. things come to life. And so um, to answer your question in short, um, yeah, we do definitely look into all the hot markets and some of the secondary markets that people might not be paying attention to. Um, most recently, I've been spending a lot of time in Houston just because a lot of dots are getting connected and Houston was really hot in the early 2000s and it's been ignored for a little while. And I think sure. that there's still a lot of relevance there to be had um, if it's cultivated properly. So I've been spending a lot of time there. Very cool. And like you said, you're, 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 you're the type of person that really wants to put you know, and when you work, when you work on a project, you want to help break that artist through different avenues of promotion. Um, I've, I've noticed that you've, you've dabbled into radio a lot and helped artists, you know, break, break into um, radio stations. I don't know, if, correct me if I'm wrong, but mostly on the West Coast from Las Vegas to Seattle to Los Angeles and the Bay Area. But, um, you know, you, you had that, um, you worked on the, the song by I Am Sue that really, you know, took off on radio, you know, when do you when do you decide that you know how, how do you how do you are you the one that's that's kind of deciding and and figures hey you know what this is a radio hit or, or is it a group effort with the whole Empire staff with with the labels team and saying hey this is this is the song that we decide to push and I think it's going to make the most impact. Well, um, you know we're a relatively new company and a small company, so I've been pretty much making those decisions now. Um, I have some people on the outskirts that, um, or excuse me, I have some people that I'm partnered with that work very closely with us that are either on retainer or, or on, a, on a partnership basis that we utilize um, to build those type things out. But um, the last three records that we took to radio, um, the last four records we took to radio were all my call. Um, I pretty much take care of that facet of the company just because mm -hmm. we haven't built that division out. Um, and I'm a, I'm a bottom-up type of person. I like to learn. Uh, different facets of the industry from the bottom up, and then I'll hire the personnel and educate the personnel to take care of that part. But, um, you know, the last four records we did, we did uh, the Love Rants Up record, of course, that ended up getting upstream to Interscope, um, and it, it did some big things. It, it was the first record that I ever worked on that went gold, um, so that was a really proud moment for us. You, you, you actually cut up, you cut off on that one. What, what was the name of that record? It was by Love Rants, it was called Up, and, it, and Interscope took it, and then Redid it right. with 50 Cent. Um, Got it. Um, and then we've done several records since. You know, we've done uh, John Hart, who's on Epic now. Record went national, went number one rhythmic. Um, and, and we have a couple of other records in the fold, some smaller artists that are doing really well right now that are at radio. Um, radio has always been an interesting beast to me. Um, ironically, my major in college was radio and television. Mm -hmm. um, so I always had a fascination with radio and a fascination with radio technology. Um, and everything about radio, the way it reaches the masses, the way it dictates trends. Um, I've always been fascinated with radio, um, but I, I never spent too much time um, involved in the politics of it until recently. What what attracts you to a song that, to make you make your brain decide that this is a radio hit? What 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 are the different you know elements of a song that kind of just really just you feel that are very important in a radio song? Is it tempo? Is it the mix? Is it the vocals? Is it the effects? You know, it's a it's a it's a vast combination of those things, and and um, that all goes back to me being 15 years old and being a DJ. One of the first things I did, I was a DJ, and so you know, I, I DJed a lot of house parties growing up, a lot of school dances, you know, a lot of clubs, yeah, um, you know, like little 18 and under spots and things of that nature. And um, being a DJ and being a producer very early on at a young age kind of teaches you crowd response. Um, and you kind of tend to learn what it is that moves or doesn't move people. And then obviously, you know, radio has a lot of regional trends. So you have to be able to identify the regional trends 
and really identify what tempo works in what market, what genre works in what market. A record that works in the Bay Area is not going to work in Atlanta, but a record in Atlanta might work in the Bay Area. Um, so it, it can get really complicated, um, you know, and then that's why, you, you know, you push records into the blog and into the DJ pools, and then you get feedbacks from the DJs, from the mixers, from the PDs, and you, and you try to, you know, it's, it's almost like, like the NBA draft, you know, you, you, you gather all these metrics about a record, and then you try to make a gut decision on what you think is the next thing to pop, just like you gather all these metrics about an athlete, and then you try to make a decision at what position do you draft them and is he going to do well for you. Um, so it's a combination of things, um, right. you know, the, the main mistake that I mean, that I see is a lot of artists spend a lot of money foolishly on radio, um, when they should be cultivating more of a, uh, grassroots fan base, not to say that there's not artists that blow without radio. I mean, without right. fan base, you know, um, a hit to uh, hit John Hart, the John Hartman record we made. I mean, he had a hundred followers on Instagram when his record caught on and Epic gave him a deal. It just blew up out of nowhere. You know, that record was on my desk and I listened to it one time and, and Power 106 was playing it in the new at two a few times a week. And that's all, that's the only story it had. And I, I just called them in the office and I was like, I just have a gut feeling about this record. Let's go on this record. Let's put together a budget and let's go. And, and, it, it and, a, you know, and a side note, and a side note to that, that record was, you know, that, that record was produced and written by uh, Beat Stars producer Ross Smooth. So, you know, that, that was a real, yeah, real cool work. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it felt good to, to break a record, you know, from my region, from the Bay Area, but also to be able to break a record from, from an art, you know, from a producer that I'm really good friends with, whose talent and that I value and whose personality, you know, he's, he's, a, great, he's a great person. Yeah, really talented. Extremely yeah, talented. Really talented, really humble, um, and a really super hard worker. You know. Yeah. So, guys, um, you know, I don't want to get caught up into too much of the, you know, digital this, digital that. You know, a, a lot of people, you know, listen, I, I love digital music, but it depends on what type of file type you're listening to. I, I hate MP3s, um, and that's why I still buy CDs. You know, and it's one of the biggest reasons why I go out to the record store and, how, you know, there might be one left in every every major metropolitan area, but... You know, I still enjoy going out to the record store and listening to a wave file, a mastered wave at full quality, no distortion, bumping in my in my car or in my headphones. And you I've noticed you you you're still you know, you've actually worked on a couple projects where you've actually distributed physical CDs and, and I see that you're starting to um, make it a focus of, of, of your companies. How important is selling physical CDs to Empire at this point? Uh, it's still very important. Um, it's, it's like I said, make music available in every avenue possible, and the physical market is still a very relevant market, um, especially depending on what type of music you have. Um, in the urban space, physical is still very relevant. Um, you know, there's still a lot of artists that are 80, 20, still 80 percent physical, 20 percent digital because of the type of fan base they have. Very street oriented fan base. Um, you know, more more into the physical product. Um, but the irony of that is, it's going to continue to dissipate very quickly over the next year or two. Um, a lot of that change is going to be become because of cars. Um, you know, you can, you can go to the store now, you can go to a dealership now and sit in a car. Many of the new cars don't have CD players. They've either put them in the, in the glove compartment, in the trunk, or completely eliminated them altogether. And right. now, you know, they're planting, uh, you know, they're planting Spotify and Pandora in their car, which is great. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's bridging the digital divide. Um, but, but the physical space to me is still very important. Vinyl is on the rise. Vinyl sales are on the rise. It's collector collectibles. Um, and at the end of the day, the sound quality is still better on a wave than it is on an MP3. Um, you know, I'm still sad to see that Super CD never worked out because I'm an audio file and I'm an audio geek. You know, I'm right, an engineer right. by heart, you know, by trade. Well, so, still considered still considered 50% of the industry, I believe, right? Still at least 50% of sales. Brian, are you there? Brian, Felson, are you there? Looking for Brian. You know, I heard somebody whistling out there. But yeah, I mean, it's still, you know, it's still a major revenue generator in the music industry. I think people, people still forget that. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted Brian on the phone, because he'll tell you that 50% of CD Baby's business, I think, is still, still, you know, pressing up CDs and shipping them out to customers. You know, that's one of their biggest, um, you know, parts of their business. So yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's still very relevant for us, because we distribute a lot of urban music. And urban music mm -hmm. is still very physical. 
Um, the physical space is still really big, and we distribute a lot of Latin music, and in the Latin space, um, physical is still really important. Um, you know, so, and, and that's why that's why we're involved in it. It's still a way, um, it's still a new music discovery tool. Um, right. m many of the artists that we distribute are very niche artists. But what's going to happen for people like me that, you know, when, when, when um, you know, when CDs are completely, you know, out of the market and I still yearn for a high quality, you know, wave, it are, do, you, do you think that the, the streaming music services, which everyone is predicting that is going to be the future of how music is going to be consumed, will they, will they, and as broadband internet in our phones become faster and stronger with, you know, LTE and things like that, will higher quality streams be available, you think, in the near future? Yeah, I, think so. I mean I mean streams are already a hundred times better now than when I started working in streaming and I was I was doing stuff in the streaming industry in the late nineties, early two thousands and people were streaming, you know, sixty four K P P S. You know, now we have three twenty streams. You know, three twenty sounds pretty good. Um, yeah. You know, the average the average listener is not gonna know the difference. Um, and it, you know what what's really ironic in today's market too is, you know, in the nineties um, in hip hop and in urban culture, having a very high end stereo system was a big deal. And, you know, now the big deal in fashion is, is earphones. And I'm sorry, an earphone is not going to produce the same frequencies as 15 inch subwoofers in your car with Nakamichi amps and the Alpine. You know, so, you know, I mean, back in the day, it was very trendy for somebody to spend $5,000 on a really high end audio system, you know, in just in their car. And so people are consume, not only consuming music differently, they're listening to it differently. You know, listening right. to a record on, on a Dr. Dre Beats earphones or earbuds or through your phone or even through a stock system in the car now is a much different experience than listening to an album in the car um, 15 years ago with completely wired from head to toe with rock with Bob Gates. Right. Uh, it's just a different way to listen to music. And so I think, I think the, you know, the vast... Uh, majority of people don't care about audio quality, uh, but there is websites that cater to that. I mean, if, if you care about audio quality, you can go to Beatport. You can buy wave files. Um, right. But, but or Beatstars. People, yeah, or Beatstars. <laughs> yeah, you know. So, um, but but now you know audio's gotten a lot better. You know, it sounds a whole lot better on Pandora. Spotify sounds a whole lot better. You know, than what streaming sounded like seven, eight, nine, ten years ago. Um, and even you know Google Play is selling three twenty. Um, Amazon is selling 256. iTunes is still, you know, at a 192. Um, and and also the files that they're requesting from us as a distribution company um, are a lot higher quality now. You know, a lot of companies are accepting full quality slack. Um, so I think I think with you know with broadband increasing and and we're going to see higher resolution files hopefully in the near future. I, I would hope so. Very cool. Uh, 24 bit audio that would sound great. Yeah. Definitely. Well, I, I, I think it's coming. I, I think it's coming. It's just a matter of network and connectivity, I think, and, and just, you know, how, how, how cheap broadband is going to be and, and how um, a lot of these licensing deals are going to be done with the majors and, and the, uh, the streaming services, you know, because at the end of the day, it's going to cost them more money to stream higher quality files. But, um, guys, I, and I forgot to ask you this when we were talking about radio and I wanted to, and it, it's very intriguing to me because I think a lot of people don't really pay attention to this, but I think certain, like you said, in certain areas, people have different preference to music, and, and certain radio stations are still playing, you know, independent music, and a lot of, a lot of um, you know, a lot of markets, you know, are not completely fully mainstream type um, markets where they, you know, they want the same five records that are played around the nation on every major radio station. There are some radio stations out there that really, you know, like to change it up and play independent music. Now, with your journey around, you know, the nation, hitting up all of these these cities, what are what are some of the territories that you've noticed that are more are more receptive to play um, independent music, and you've had an easier time breaking into? Um, you know, it's usually the secondary markets are usually a little more open format. Um, you don't got to pay as many bills. <laughs> so, you know, they're a little more open format. Um, satellite got it. radio is much, is much more open format. You know, right. satellite radio is much more open format. Um, the thing is, most radio stations have some type of mix show, and the mix show is where you usually get the most creative freedom, um, whether it's morning mix show, afternoon mix show, overnights you know, your, your Friday, like, club commute at 1 in the morning or whatever. 
Um, so usually, usually you got mixed shows and variety shows on, on the big, big dog stations. Um, and then you still got, you know, you still got guys like the Baker Boys and you got guys like Sway and Funkmaster Flex and, you know, people right. all, you know, Big Pond in the Bay Area, you know, people all across, you know, Greg Street down in, 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 um, in Atlanta. You got, you got guys all across the country that are tastemakers and, and still breaking new artists and, and playing new things. I mean, otherwise we wouldn't have new music, period. Um, you know, things would be, it's already cookie cutter as it is. It'd be extremely cookie cutter. Um, but, you know, but we're facing other issues in radio other than just, you know, mix show and what, you know, what radio stations are easier to get things played at, and this, that, and the other. You know, radio's going through consolidation just like every other facet of the music industry. So you're seeing a lot right. of consolidation of, of radio stations. You're seeing consolidations of playlists. Um, you're seeing um, playlists that are going to premium choice, where it means like one whole region is under one playlist from one program director. Yep. Um, and we're talking about like a big region, um, mm-hmm. not, on the, not on the metropolitan level, you know, on a state level or on a multi-state level, um, where, you know, one radio station might program for 20 radio stations. Some That's crazy. Like that. I'm I'm not an expert in radio, but you know I I doubt it, so. Right. Uh, well, let's tap let's tap into more about you know Empire and some of the um you know the details and resources that you know you you provide for artists. Now a lot of artists when you know when signing up with a distribution company or partnering with a label, they always want to know when do I get paid, how much do I get paid, and how long is my deal. What what kind of what kind of you know just generally it doesn't have to be specific, but what kind of you know uh, general deals. Um, are you are you doing for independent artists and and how how often are they getting paid? Well, I mean, like I said, we're structured a lot different than most companies. Um, we're we're turning into a three-headed dragon slowly but surely, um, and we're evolving more into a record label every every more and more every day. Um, when we started the company, we were about 100% distribution and 0% label. I would say now we're probably 70% distribution company and 30% label services. Um, my hope is to get that to 50/50 as soon as possible. Um, I want to evolve into a label. Um, it's more creative, um, it's more exciting, it's more passionate for me, um, and you know I'll do this as long as I'm passionate about music, I'll stay in the game. And so, um, but our deals can range anyway, you know. And when I say three headed dragon, you know, uh, we have Empire Distribution. Uh, we're launching Empire Recordings. Uh, the first two, we have three artists on Empire Recordings right now. We have Emilio Rojas from the East Coast, and then mm-hmm. two artists from the area. We have D'Lo. Um, who's a really big artist in the streets out here, and we got another kid named Stage Gemini, who has a huge high school bus. Um, wow! And so, awesome. Yeah, I didn't know that. I mean, Emilio, Emilio has a strong name for himself, and so does Zillow. That's awesome, man. Congrats on that. Thank you. And um, and then we're we're starting a publishing division, um, and so we're going to start admitting a lot of publishing, um, advancing money for publishing rights, you know, for writers and composers, people that can possibly come out of your system. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, our, uh, for, all, for all intents and purposes, 90% of our business occurs in the Empire Distribution level for now. But Empire Distribution for us functions much like a farm system. You know, um, we sign a lot of deals there. We do a lot of marketing and promotion for just our pure distribution deals. Um, and, you know, sometimes gems poke out. And when they poke out, we migrate them over to the, uh, to the recording side of the company. And then maybe put them in a different type of a contract where we, you know, we put we put some money behind them and start right. moving around different facets uh, of of you know of their repertoire. Um, Very cool. But, but, and I think you know, and I think the most important portion. Yeah, I think the most right. important right. portion. I think one year deal, non-exclusive. We pay out every month. That's that's the Got standard. It. Got it. Got it. People think we're crazy for non-exclusive, but. Um, you know, we very rarely lose labels. So if we're doing our job and our labels are comfortable staying with us, things can stay non-exclusive. We're not investing any money. All we're right. doing is investing resources. And they're investing their talent, and we're investing our, our resources, and we're trying to build something together. If, if things sense. go into a more exclusive path, then we can entertain that as we go along. But our general deal is non-exclusive one year, um, and, and uh, that's pretty much it. We pay every month. Wow. I mean, that must be the reason why TI and TI put out that uh... – that single with you guys. I mean, that's just, I mean, that's amazing, especially in this day and age when, you know, you, especially when you as a label are committing so much money and resources into projects, you know, a lot of people think you are crazy for 
doing non-exclusive deals. But that is a more honest way to do business and where people are more, um, you know, bringing their best foot forward to the table on each side. That's dope. Really cool. Yeah, um, you might transition to a more exclusive situation later on, but, you know, if it's, if it's not broke, don't fix it. It's real simple. Real simple thought cool. process. So I, I think I think the you know because you know you've talked about being more of a label and you know being very selective with the type of artists and labels that you do work with, um, but you did bring up you know the empire publishing side, which is kind of a, a portion of the business that affects everybody at every level. Um, do you plan at at some point to implement a system? Where you know anyone can can that that is getting online streams that are that are you know you know you know putting their music in places where you know they never sometimes they're in places where they don't where the artist doesn't even know it's in and would you ever put in a system in place for all independent artists to be able to tap into that um, that system and you know collect for them on the sound exchange side and the publishing side and and all the other different sides where where people really don't understand and know about um, that side of the business. Yeah, that's that's our long term. Um, you know, that that side of the business is still being very aggressively planned out. So uh, I got to keep you posted on that because we haven't launched that division yet. But it's very cool. it's very much in the works and it's very near to coming to fruition. So it's going to launch soon. Um, we'll have a lot more details about that in the next three to six months. Very cool, man. I think I've you know I've talked your ear off tonight, man. I think we've we've you know a lot of for, for a free seminar, I think a lot of the artists and, and producers and everyone that's in music got a lot of great information, um, a lot of insight, a lot of insider information um, that a lot of artists, a lot of labels don't really share, you know? Uh, uh, do you think we should take some questions, if there was any questions? Yeah, yeah, let's, let's, um, let's open it up. Who's, who's willing to, to jump on, jump on and ask some questions? We're going we're gonna to turn the... We're going to turn, in, we're gonna turn it into a Q&A session where you guys can unmute yourselves and come on in. All of it, and they unmute themselves by pressing star six. All right, guys, so if you press star six, you can unmute yourself. So if you have any questions, go ahead and bring it out for Ghazi Shan, CEO of Empire Distribution. Peace. Hello? What's up? What's up, man? What's your name? Stock Strange from Stronghold Recording Studios, East Orange, New Jersey. Good to have you, man. Good to have you. Likewise, my question was just regarding yep. putting out independent music. What are some of the best ways to do things when you're getting your name Good. and your music out there and people are saying, well, we don't really know you, we don't know uh, what we should pay you because you don't have a name, but you know your quality of music is good, and you just really try to be fair, not to rob anybody, but at the same token, not be robbed. Let me let me uh, rephrase your question to see if I understand it. You're saying, as a new artist, what's the best medium to get your music out there to be heard, so that you can justify being paid for music? Or are you are you referring to yourself as a producer or as a or you know? Uh, Both actually. Both. Was that? Both actually, because I'm uh, dealing with a recording studio, so we do production, and we have our artists who're so just trying to look out for their best interests like I said, and be able to get our music out without necessarily always being worried about paying somebody or being paid to a point that it causes us more damage than actually benefits. Well, I mean, okay, so I, I could give you an honest answer about that because I ran a music studio for much of my life. I mean, that's how I made most of my living. And uh, I've seen the homie PR came on. Steve. Uh, Peace. But, but uh, uh, a good way to answer that is this. When I ran a music studio, there was two things that I had to do to survive. One was pay bills, and the other thing was to do was to increase my network and increase my value, both as a producer, as a writer. I, you know, I, I made music. I did all every facet of the music you could think of. So from, from, the, from the standpoint that I needed to make a living, obviously, you've got to take records that you've got to mix, produce, or do whatever to pay bills. But then you usually have some extra free time. Um, and I, what I did with my free time was make sure I always devoted it to people who were cream of the crop that represented my vision and represented my brand and what it was that I wanted to accomplish. And so even if that meant doing a free mix, when I did a free mix for an artist that was really relevant in my region and that could give me a good look, then I would do that free mix. 
if it meant making a beat for the outlaws and giving play to the outlaws in the year 2001 when the outlaws were hot, then that's what I did. So, you know, I, you have to find a happy medium of what do I got to do to pay the bills and then what do I got to do to also increase my market footprint? Who, who are the people that are in my – you're in Jersey, right? What part of Jersey? Yes. Uh, Essex part? County, North, East Orange area, right outside of New York City. Mm-hmm. Okay, so you're by New York City. So, I mean, there's, there's a, you live in a mecca of major label artists or artists that have, have fallen off majors or artists that are on their way to major label deals. Align yourself with some artists that make sense for your studio and for your sound that would represent what it is that you're trying to accomplish. Definitely. Thank you. You know, being that I was from the Bay Area, you know, like, there was artists yep. in my time that made sense for me to do things for. You know, even if it meant I wasn't going to make as much money. You know, when I was coming up, out was hot. You know, Messi Marvin, San Quinn, Yuck Mouth, these guys were wow. hot in my area. So I was working with those guys, and I was doing free mixes or mixes for, for cheap in the beginning until, you know, people realized, wow, this, this guy's a great engineer. Like, I want him to mix my record, too. Okay, in charge. Well, now, now my brand has increased um, because of the people that I've allied myself with or aligned myself with, um, and people that represent me. And then, you know, at some point, you, you know, in my era, when I was mixing, records were still hitting the shelf a lot. You know, so you would go to a store and you know, 30 CDs are on the shelf that have your mix credits on it, and people are turning those credits and looking at them and saying, oh, well, he did it, so he's got to do mine too. Next thing you know, I was getting calls from Seattle, from L.A. Next thing you know, I was, I was mixing Dogtown records and, and other artists from the West Coast that were relevant at the time because they heard, you know, some of the quality and some of the things that I was doing for other people. So I would say um, you really got to find that balance of I'm trying to pay the bills, but I also want to make, you know, I also want to put my best foot forward and represent my brand and do things exactly. to increase my brand. All right, let's take another question. Uh, we got Tracy G. Allen up here. Go ahead. Tracy G., you there? All right, anybody else want to have a question for Gazi? All right, guys, looks like we're going to wrap this up. Gazi, thank you so much for... Uh, Talking about the beast seminars, we definitely will be doing a lot more with. Sorry, man, I had to mute. I had to mute everybody, but um, guys, thanks, thanks again, man. Uh, much love, love Empire. Please, guys, check out EmpireDistribution.com. Follow them on Twitter, and uh, and you know, pay attention to a company that's definitely going to be making a way for themselves, and already are. Um, just just pay attention to what they're doing, and um, you definitely will be inspired. Thanks again, guys. Uh, follow me on Twitter. It's at Godzilla. That's G-H-A-Z-I-L-L-A. Same with my Instagram, at Godzilla, G-H-A-Z-I-L-L-A. Um, my, my employees are forcing, forcing me to be more active in the social world, so I'm doing it. <laughs> Got to. You have to. You have to. I appreciate all you guys' time. Um, check out the website, Um, And, you know, keep doing big things. I wish 